Thank you for watching me on YouTube. As always, I present myself as an honest, unapologetic voice out there for those who are willing to listen. I usually talk about issues facing my community, the government, and of course the corrupt mainstream media. <laughs> in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I'm Scott Pelley with CBS News along with my colleague Major Garrett of National Journal. In just under a year now, Americans will go to the polls to choose a president. Mr. Kane, I'd like to begin this evening with you, sir. Yes. This week, a U.N. nuclear watchdog agency provided additional credible evidence that Iran is pursuing a nuclear weapon. If you were president right now, what would you do specifically that this administration is not doing to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon? The first thing that I would do is to assist the opposition movement in Iran that's trying to overthrow the regime. Our enemies are not the people of Iran, it's the regime. And a regime change is what they are trying to achieve. Secondly, we need to put economic pressure on Iran by way of our own energy independence strategy. Governor Romney, would it be worth going to war to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon? Well, let's, let's start back from there and let's talk about where we are. Uh, this is, of course, President Obama's greatest failing from a foreign policy standpoint, which is he recognized the gravest threat that America and the world faces, uh, had faced was the nuclear Iran. And he did not do what was necessary to get Iran to be dissuaded from their nuclear folly. What he should have done is speak out when dissidents took to the streets and say America is with you and work on a covert basis to encourage the dissidents. Number two, he should have put, put in place crippling sanctions against Iran. But instead of getting Russia, for instance, to uh, when he gave in our, our missile defense system to agree to, uh, to stand with those crippling sanctions, he gave Russia what they wanted, their number one foreign policy objective, and got nothing in return. The time, and finally, Governor, on the question, well, we're going to adhere 60, to time I get very 60 quickly, seconds. but let me... I get 60 yeah, seconds. Yeah, Sorry, it started at yellow, so I, I have much more time to go. You described where we are today, and that's what you're going to have to deal with if you become president. How do you prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon? Is it worth going to war to prevent that? Well, it's worth putting in place crippling sanctions. It's worth working with the insurgents in the country to encourage regime change in the country. And if all else fails, if after all of the work we've done, there's nothing else we can do besides mil take military action, then of course you take military action. It is unacceptable for Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Well, let me start and say that both the answers you just got are superior to the current administration. Uh, and you know, there are a number of ways to be smart about Iran and relatively few ways to be dumb, and the administration skipped all the ways to be smart. Congressman Paul, let me follow up with you for just 30 seconds. Is it worth going to war to prevent a nuclear weapon in Iran? No, it isn't worthwhile. And the only way you would do that is uh, you would have to go to the Congress. We, we as Commander-in-Chief, aren't making the decision to go to war. You know, the old-fashioned way, the Constitution, you go to the Congress and find out if our national security is threatened. And uh, I'm afraid what's going on right now is similar to the war propaganda that went on against Iraq. And, you know, they didn't have new, uh, weapons of mass destruction, and it was orchestrated, and it was, to me, a tragedy of what's happened these past last 10 years, the death and destruction, $4, billion, $4 trillion in debt. So, no, it's not worth while going to war. If you do, you get a declaration of war, and you fight it, and you win it, and get it over with. Let me answer uh, the previous question very quickly for our if I, if I may. This country can sanction the Iranian Central Bank right now 
and shut down that country's economy. And that's what this president needs to do, and the American people need to stand up and force him to make that stand today. Now let me address this issue of Afghanistan and how we deal with this. The mission must be completed there. Uh, the idea that we will have wasted our treasure and the lives of young Americans to not secure Afghanistan is not appropriate. But the idea that we would give a timetable to our enemy is irresponsible from a military standpoint. It's irresponsible from the lives of our young men and women. And it is irresponsible leadership of this president to give a timetable to pull out of any country that we're in conflict with. Senator Santorum, I know you want to jump in on Iran. I'll give you that opportunity here in just a second. So let me merge two things if I could, just one second. The Taliban said earlier this summer, quote, the Afghans have an endless stamina for a long war. If you were commander in chief, would you have endless stamina for victory in Afghanistan? And would you this evening define victory in Afghanistan for the American people? And please weigh in, I know you do want to, on Iran. Uh, victory against uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan is that uh, the Taliban is a neutered force. They are no longer a security threat uh, to the, to the uh, Afghan people or to, to our country. That would be victory. Doesn't mean wipe them out, you can't wipe them out, but they're no longer a security threat. Uh, the bigger issue, and <clears throat> I know there's those of us at the end who don't get a lot of questions, and so I, I, this, was the, this was the most important national security issue that we're going to be dealing with here in this, in this year, and that's the issue of Iran getting a nuclear weapon. I think everyone should have the opportunity to answer that question. And I proposed exactly the things that Herman and, and, and Mitt Romney suggested, which was to give money to the, uh, to the, to the rebel forces there to, uh, to help the pro-democracy movement and to put tough sanctions in place. I think the 30,000 surge troops in Afghanistan have made a difference, and if so, where? They absolutely have, but it's unfortunate the request was made for 40,000 troops. President Obama dithered for approximately two months when he should have given the full complement of 40,000 troops. When he gave 30,000 troops to the effort in Afghanistan, that method of decision had to be made. They could have conducted the war going into the southern province in, in Helmand and also going into the eastern province and dealing with the problem all at once and coming to victory that much sooner. Come over to you, Governor Huntsman, and, and ask you, we are seeing spikes in casualties in Afghanistan in new places. Can you explain to me what's happening there and how you would change that? Well, I think the uh, spikes obviously are driven by uh, lack of security, proper security in certain parts of the country, which could plague us for a very, very long time to come. I take a different approach on Afghanistan. I say it's time to come home. Governor Romney, a much smaller footprint in Afghanistan, do you support that? And secondarily, sir, is it time or would it ever be time for the United States to negotiate with the Taliban? We don't negotiate with terrorists. With regards to our footprint in Afghanistan, the right course is for us to do our very best to secure the victories that have been so hard won by the soldiers, the men and women of, of, of our fighting forces. That we, we don't have a clue how hard this is going to be. First of all, the Taliban survives for the very same reason that historically we've said guerrillas always survive, which is they have a sanctuary. The sanctuary is Pakistan. You're never going to stop the Taliban as long as they can serve hide. And you, and you approve every week in new bombings and new killings and new training. Pakistan, friend or foe? We don't know, because Pakistan is where Osama bin Laden was found and eliminated. Secondly, Pakistan has had a conversation with President Karzai from Afghanistan, and, they, and President Karzai has said that if the United States gets into a dispute with Pakistan, then Afghanistan is going to side with Pakistan. There is a lot of clarity missing, like Speaker Gingham says, in this whole region, and they are all interrelated. So that isn't a clear answer as to whether or not Pakistan is a friend or foe. That relationship must be re-evaluated. It's clearly sending us messages that they, have, they don't deserve our foreign aid that we're getting because they're not being honest with us. American soldiers' lives are being put at jeopardy because of that country and the decisions that they're made. And, and it's time for us as a country to say no to foreign aid to countries that don't support the United States of America. We need a President of the United States working with a Congress that sends a clear message to every country. It doesn't make any difference whether it's Pakistan or whether it's Afghanistan or whether it's India. The foreign aid budget in my administration for every country is going to start at zero dollars. Zero dollars.
Pakistan is a very difficult area because they have been housing terrorists and terrorists have been training there, Al-Qaeda as well as Haqqani as well as other militias dealing with terrorist organizations. But I would not agree with that assessment to pull all foreign aid from Pakistan. I would reduce foreign aid to many, many countries, but there's a problem because Pakistan has a nuclear weapon. We have decided we want to lose in the war on terror under President Obama. That's not my strategy. My strategy will be that the United States will be victorious in the war on terror. Congressman Paul, my spidey sense tells me we have a debate about to get launched here. I know you have an opinion you'd like to weigh in. Uh, yes, um, tor torture is illegal. And by our laws, it's illegal by international laws. How do you, how do you define torture, sir? Well, waterboarding is torture, and uh, and many other things. It's, Ill it's illegal under international law and under our law. It's also immoral, and it's also very impractical. There's no evidence that you really get reliable evidence. Why would you accept the position of torturing 100 people because you know one person might have information? And that's what you do when you accept the principle of a, of, of, uh, uh, of torture. I think it's it, I think it's uncivilized and have no practical advantages and it's really un-American to accept on principle that we will torture people that we capture. This country has values. We have a name brand in the world. I've lived overseas four times. I've been an ambassador for my country three times. I've lived overseas and done business. We diminish our standing in the world and the values that we project, which include liberty, democracy, human rights, and open markets when we torture. We should not torture. Waterboarding is torture. We dilute ourselves down like a whole lot of other countries and we lose that ability to project values that a lot of people in corners of this world are still relying on the United States to stand up for. Peter if a Pakistani nuclear weapon goes missing, what do you do? Well, let me just stop back and, and, and say I disagree with a lot of what was said out here. Um, Pakistan must be a friend of the United States for the reason that Michelle outlined. Pakistan is a nuclear power and there are people in, this, in that country that if they gain control of that country will create a situation equal to the situation that is now percolating in Iran. It is that important and we must maintain that relationship. But the Pakistanis back a terrorist network, the Haqqani network, that laid siege to the NATO headquarters and the U.S. Embassy in Kabul for 20 hours a few weeks ago. So the Pakistanis How do you make they friends out of Pakistan? A lot of the Pakistanis and most of the government would say they don't back the Haqqani network and the Haqqani network causes as much trouble in Pakistan as it has caused us in, in Afghanistan. I well remember you talking to speaker about the necessary or the necessity of leaders to think outside the box. Yes. If you were president, how would you think outside the box about some of the issues we've discussed here tonight? Well, in a number of ways. As I said earlier, I would, I would explicitly adopt the Reagan, John Paul II, Thatcher strategy towards Iran. I would do the same thing towards North Korea. I would adopt a very strong policy towards the United Nations of uh, dramatically taking on its, its absurdities. I would explicitly repudiate what Obama's done on Agenda 21 as the kind of interference from the United Nations as well. Uh, there are a number of other areas. I would also frankly apply a lean six segment of the Pentagon to liberate the money to rebuild the Navy. We're, we're, we, we need a capital investment program and this administration is shrinking the Navy to a point where it's going to be incapable of its doing its job worldwide. So there are a number of places I would be thinking outside the box. No. Romney, recently President Obama ordered the death of an American citizen who was suspected of terrorist activity overseas. Is it appropriate for the American president, on the president's say-so alone, to order the death of an American citizen suspected of terrorism? Absolutely. In this case, this is an individual who had aligned himself with a, with a group that had declared war on the United States of America. And, uh, and if there's someone that's going to join with a group like Al-Qaeda that declares war in America and we're in, a, in a, uh, a war with that entity, then of course anyone who is bearing arms with that entity is fair game for the United States of America. Let me go back. Let me go back and just, and just talk for a moment about the issue that a number of people have spoken about, which is their definition of how their foreign policy might be different than this president. China has an interest in trade. China wants to, as they have 20 million people coming out of the farms and coming into the cities every year, they want to be able to put them to work. They want to have access to global markets. And so we have right now something they need very badly. 
which is access to our market and our friends around the world have that same uh, power over China. We need to make sure that we let them understand that in order for them to continue to have free and open access to the thing they want so badly, our markets, they have to play by the rules. They can't hack into our computer systems and steal from our government. They can't steal from corporations. They can't take patents and designs, intellectual property, and, and, uh, and, and duplicate them and uh, duplicate them and counterfeit them and sell them around the world. And they also can't manipulate their currency in such a way as to make their prices well below what they otherwise would be. We have to have China understand that like everybody else on the world stage, they have to play by the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, the applause are lovely, but we will not have booing. Thank you very much. We'll have, we'll have courtesy for all of the candidates on the stage.